Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast, where it's all about real women, real stories, real inspiration. And now your host and creator of Moms Making Six Figures, Heidi Bartolotta. Hi, Moms Making Six Figures. Today, my interview is with Tisha Parker, and I really think you're going to love this one. She's a mom of five to start, and she owns three very successful businesses. So she started out with owning a hair salon, and you'll hear her story leading up to that, which led into a hair extension line and then teaching courses on how to apply those hair extensions. And I think there's so many pieces of wisdom in her story in growing three businesses and growing five children and a healthy marriage. And I'm really excited for this. So I hope you enjoy listening. So I am here today with my new friend, Tisha Parker. Yes. And if it's okay, I'm just going to ask you a few questions. You're a mom of five. How about I start with that? Yes, I am. And you own multiple businesses all yeah. very successful, Thank but you. they didn't all start out that way. No, <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> Not at all. So let's start with that. Let's start okay. with your businesses. How did you end up in the field that you're in? And let's just talk about that. Okay. Um, so I went to beauty school at 16. I originally wanted to be a doctor who delivers babies. So what's that called? An OBGYN. Yeah. Yes. And then I realized how much schooling it was. I'm like, no, that's not for me. <laughs> so I decided to go to beauty school at 16. And we had an ROP program that allowed you to go while you're still in high school. Mm. I graduated a year early. So I left as a sophomore and came back as a senior mm -hmm. and then went to beauty school from there. But my beauty school was about an hour away. So my mom decided to go with me because she didn't feel comfortable me driving all the way to Napa, California. Like a good mother. I know. Right? And she was done raising her five kids. So she's like, what am I going to do with my life? So we went to school together. And I remember so many drives her, you know, we just talked back and forth. And I would just say, I'm going to own a salon one day. I just know it. I just know it. And fast forward years, um, there was a lot of stepping stones into that. It did not just start off where mommy and daddy gave me money and I opened up a salon. It was, I assisted and paid my dues is what they call it in our industry is just paying my dues and working for literally nothing and being, um, can I say crapped on? Yes. Okay. Being crapped on and um, picking up kids from school when that wasn't even my job description, but I saw the big picture, right? And so um, fast forward, my salon owner, all of a sudden went from a commission salon to lease. And she's like, if you guys can't lease, then you need to get out like today. So I went from assisting one of the biggest salons at the time here to working for hair masters, which not dogging on anybody that works at hair masters, it's a stepping stone, but it was hard going backwards for me. And then, um, after I did that for two years, I ended up taking the big leap in leasing and I worked there for eight years and there was just there were some relationships that were really hard for me because it went from I used to be their assistant to now I'm their coworker, mm -hmm. and they couldn't really transition that in their mind of like you used to go pick up my kids and now like I'm your peer mm -hmm. you know so um I just love to be happy like I love it I thrive off of it and sometimes I would say I live in the clouds which is not always great and so I, I just, think it's great. Well, thanks. <laughs> but my husband wouldn't always say that. Um, but that's why he's my perfect balance. But uh, I just really wanted to create an environment where people could come in and just do great hair, but just be happy. You know, like you don't have to go to work and worry about, you know, not seeing your coworker for three days. And then there's this awkwardness of like, are they mad at me? Because that's when you work in a salon of 15 women, mm -hmm. that happens. It's interesting. I never would have thought about that dynamic. But oh, it makes so much sense. Now it's that so you say hard. It. And it's like it is the capital of frenemies, you know, like keep your friends close and then your coworkers who might be climbing the charts, you know, or doing better hair, keep them a little closer, you know. 
At least that's my experience. That's probably not everybody's. But um, that was my goal. I wasn't in it for the money at all. I was just like, I don't even care if I make any extra than what I'm already paying in a lease. I just want to create a safe space where I can be me and not feel like intimidated to just be however I want to be. So I opened up the salon and it was a lot of stinking work. At the time I had a two and three year old and I I had to convince my husband that I could do it. And I didn't know how I was going to fill the stations or how any of that was going to work, but I knew I was going to do it. So I actually just started DMing people and said, I'm opening up a salon. Can I meet with you? I want to show you like my plan. And I created a whole album on my iPad of all my inspiration because at the time, the building used to be the old pie hole, but it had been sitting empty for three years. So there was asbestos. There was holes in the wall, exposed plumbing. There was um, liquid nails everywhere. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to fill these stations with literally the way this building looks? Mm -hmm. There's nothing to show anybody as to why they'd want to come work with me. So I sat him down. I wouldn't take him there first. You painted the vision. I painted the vision. And I like sat in, uh, we actually went to Flatbread. I took everyone to Flatbread. And I just started scrolling through all my inspiration of this is what it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually overfilled the stations. And I had to let someone go before we even opened because I was so, like, I need to make sure these are full. That was my first business mistake. <laughs> So let me ask you a couple of questions that came up in what you were saying. So um, I think that it's really impactful to hear that you somewhat struggled, I would say, in the beginning and had to step back. What lessons did you learn from that? Because I'm guessing that when you opened the salon, a lot of those things were things that you learned that helped you to, that helped you to do things maybe a little bit differently or understand how to do things in a way because you had gone through so much early on. Is that accurate? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, there was a – for me, it was deciding who I wanted to be regardless of the lessons because before I opened this salon, I was going to take all the girls that were at my old salon with me and – the night before I was supposed to sign my lease, I had already paid $5,000 for an architect. They were requiring all these things of me in order for them to come follow me. And they all bailed on me literally the night before I was supposed to sign my lease. So I was out $5,000 before anything. And uh, it was very traumatic. And that was the first, like, am I just going to go, well, that was a great dream? Mm-hmm. Or am I going to continue on? And that... I wanted, to be honest with you, that night I got the phone call. I bawled my eyes out, and I'm like, maybe this is what God has for me, and I'm just I'm just going to throw in the towel. I'm going to go back to work. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, for a couple weeks I did that, and then all of a sudden I was like, kept looking at buildings and buildings. I'm like, this is just not dead. So first to me, it's it was I had to see the big picture because there's always going to be those things that knock you back five steps, and you have to like dust yourself off. So it was getting thick skin because mm-hmm. I'm very sensitive. Mm-hmm. And my first lesson, I would say, is not attaching my worth to my businesses and keeping those separate. Because it's very easy to think when it, when people reject your business that they're rejecting you. Mm-hmm. And that I did, hardcore. <laughs> and had many crying nights like, I'm just a loser. My, my ideas suck, you know. And then dusting myself off and having to get back up. Mm-hmm. So that was probably the first learning lesson is not realize is realizing just that. Like, and did you give yourself the pep talk, or was there someone in your ear? <clears throat> did you have someone that was pushing you forward? And um, I would say my husband. He's like the perfect opposite of me. And when we're vibing, he's exactly what I need to hear. He's he's all the things I don't want to hear sometimes, but I need to hear, <laughs> yeah. truthfully. And when I'm not in the mood to hear it, that's where we butt heads. But um, he's he's really, he owns his own car dealership. And so he was really great with business. And he's mm-hmm. 
He's more all business and I'm more like all emotions, all people. So it's a great combination, but he really had to give me that pep talk and, and my parents and, you know, I prayed a lot about it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Many nights I was like, I need a visual sign that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how that went. So fast forward, you have a very, very successful salon. It yeah. sounds like you had some hurdles in making that happen. Yes. And then you started another business and another business. So yeah. <laughs> talk about that it sounds progression. Overwhelming, even just thinking about it. <laughs> so yeah, so I was about two years into the salon. And at the time... Um, the salon wasn't making a ton of money. If you are listening out there and you're a hairdresser, you know that lease salons, they're not like your biggest money makers. It's kind of like there's a gla there's a cap and you can make what you make and that's it. Um, so I was fine with that. And my girlfriend had taken a hair extension course and I have done several different types. I did like the tape-ins and all the ones that I could get for cheap or I'd get on YouTube and learn myself. And my girlfriend went to San Diego and paid over $6,000 to learn a really, it was the leading hair extension company at the time. And I just couldn't afford it, nor did I want to pay it. Mm -hmm. And so she came back and she was jazzed up and there was a little bit I mean, I'm just going to say, like, there were some envious, there were some jealous feelings of, like, not towards her, but just, like, what I knew that method could do for her business. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that. Um, because at the time, I had my little kids, and I was still working full-time and owning the salon, and I led worship at my church. And I was just like, I need to work less, but I don't want to lose money. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I mean, for a week straight, I sat in my kitchen and— put on the office on my computer, which is like my favorite show for that sound drowning noise. And I just started going to town and there was beads all over my floor. And I just kept going back at it and sewing and then taking pictures and redoing and redoing. And then um, I faked it till I made it and did my first client. I'm like, there's this new method that I'm doing. Didn't want to tell her it was mine in case it failed. <laughs> and uh, I put it in her head and I'll never forget. It was like, I didn't hear from her for like 14 weeks. And most hair extension companies that are hand tied, they say six to eight weeks. And I didn't hear from her. And I was like, oh my God, she's so mad at me. <laughs> she made all this money. And like, she just, I lost my client. And then 14 weeks later, I heard from her and she's like, hey, I need my extensions moved up. And I'm like, what? They're still in your head? I've never heard of extensions that last almost four months. So she came back in and then I just started posting about it. And it was really just to get new clients for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I had hairstylists reach out to me and be like, hey, can I, do you teach classes? And I was like, yes, I teach classes. Of course, I actually have one next month coming right up, you know. And uh, I taught my first class two months after I had my daughter. Um, so that was almost three years ago. And from there, it was like social media just took me to this new place where I ended up going all the way to New York. And I just remember at the time I had an assistant and I said, I'm going to be in New York one day. By the end of this year, we'll be in New York teaching this class. And when we got that call, we both started crying. Mm -hmm. It was like, you can really do anything you put your mind to. Mm -hmm. And you can manifest things and you can, um, yeah, I could go on and on. But anyways, yeah. That's amazing. And there's so many things out of it. So first of all, I love that you said yes, even when you weren't doing it. Because I would say most of the women that I've interviewed that are insanely successful and the friends that I have that are men that are insanely successful, they just say yes. It's like, I'm going to figure yeah. it out as I go. Okay, that's a great option. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. So because imagine where you would be if you had said, oh, no, I'm not teaching. Right. Yeah. It would and have been a completely different course totally, for you. Totally. And one thing I want people to know is, like, the fear is still there. Yes. It doesn't leave you. Like, mm -hmm. it's still there the whole time. And when you say yes, you commit. Mm -hmm. So now it's that fire that makes you move forward. Mm -hmm. Because if I said no, I could go, I just need a couple more months because how am I going to build out the mm -hmm. kits? And how am I going to do this? And how am I going to do that? Which those questions never fail. But now you have a due date. Yeah. It makes you move forward. Mm -hmm. So 
that's what I would say to people that are even just wanting to do that is like, say yes, even when you want to say no, Mm -hmm. you know, like one of the main things I tell people when I'm talking to them is like, when you think about your comfort zone, it's a zone for a reason. And so when you're in your comfort zone, there's no growth Mm -hmm. because you're comfortable. So it's the minute you step outside of that zone, outside of that electric fence that you think is going to shock you, break you, burn you, is where all your opportunity is, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's your yes. And then it grows. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Okay, so we've talked a lot about business. Let's talk about motherhood because you and I had this conversation (laughs) about balance. Yeah. What is so that? So you have five children and you have three businesses. <sighs> Talk about balance. <laughs> I, I wish I could say I mastered it, but it's a uh, balance for me is seasons. You know, it's all like it, it, everything is a season is what I've had to learn. And it's in each season, in each season of balancing, it's what am I giving up to what am I getting? Mm -hmm. You know, and when I first opened the salon and I talked to my parents and I'm like, I just, I want to be such a good mom and being a motherhood is everything. And I don't want to give up being a good mom for what money and all the things I want to do. That seems selfish. Mm -hmm. And my dad was like, it's a season. And these are the seasons where your kids don't remember. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back and I'm like, what's the earliest age that I remember? Probably 12 that I have vivid memories. So I got some time to build a foundation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's balancing like how how much I'm home or I might work really hard for two weeks and then take a break for two weeks. And sometimes I have no balance and then I got to get it back in check. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my kids get goldfish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know what to say. Like that's just the way it is. That's reality. It's reality. Mm -hmm. You might have fast food for a week and they're not complaining. It's you. Right. It's the self guilt. Yeah. You know, like when you let them watch a little extra TV so you can write some emails, they're seeing it as I'm like, I get some extra screen time. Right. They're thrilled. Totally. And you're judging the heck out of yourself. Right. And they love mac and cheese. So (laughs) they don't care. It's me. It's me (laughs) seeing what else is out there. And I think it all is the stem of comparison. You know, these Instagram moms or these Pinterest moms. And it's cliche for a reason. You know, I feel like, you know, they push all their mess to outside of the shot, Mm -hmm. but it's still there. We just don't see it. Right. And then we judge ourselves based on what we do see. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, sorry to all my clients when I say this, but I can't tell you the years that I've sat there and done hair and clients that just brag on their amazing life and then Eight months later, they're getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. And here I am like, my husband sucks. (laughs) Like, listen to what her husband, he's bringing her flowers. He's doing this. He's doing that. My husband's a loser. (laughs) You know, those are those emotions that you feel. And then you feel like they're getting a divorce. And you're like, actually, my husband's bomb. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) you start comparing to what you think someone else's reality is. And that's not what it is. Yeah. So. So your best mom tip? Oh, gosh. My best mom tip is like, I tell my kids and my husband all the time, it's, I don't care about anything else. I want my kids to feel loved. And I don't care what that looks like. Mm -hmm. It's, they're going to know they're loved. They're going to know that I'm for them. And they might have mac and cheese for dinner. They might have more screen time than usual. They might look like homeless children when we go into the grocery store because that has happened many times where we all my husband has said are you really gonna wear that out and I'm like yeah <laughs> I really am my daughter's wearing rain boots and a costume and her hair's a rat's nest and I'm a hairstylist <laughs> but my kids are gonna know they're loved and they're gonna love people mm-hmm. those are the two things I always tell my kids that's so, beautiful that's the only thing they can carry with them you know mm-hmm. so So do you remember when you hit six figures? Yes, I do remember. I remember when my very first class, the the stylist paid me $2,000 for six girls. And I uh, almost threw up specific. I mean, I remember I'm like, I feel guilty 
And then I remember when I started teaching classes, um, my very first class, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to charge $600 a class. And then I started counting the heads and I was like, this is wrong. I, I, I remember specifically laying in the bath and I'm like, I need to give this money away is what I said to my husband. I'm like, I need to give it away. I feel guilty because I really don't, it sounds crazy and cliche, but like I don't do it for the money. Mm-hmm. I love people. I love connecting with people. And I think that is a tip for being successful is when you chase the money, mm-hmm. it's like it's never enough and you forget the people. But when you focus on the people, you look in your bank account and you're like, what? You know, because mm-hmm. people don't buy things. They buy people, people. you yes. know. So I remember that day. That was that was a that was a cry day. Mm-hmm. That was a I can't believe this is happening to me day. And um, yeah, that's a good description of it. And cry it felt day. really good when I was looking at my husband like, what? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> not really. But, you know, there's that moment where you're just like. There's, there's something to be said for those classic husband-wife roles, but there's something to be said for feeling independent, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah, it feels good. And don't you think it strengthens the relationship, too? I think in some relationships. Some relationships, I think it creates tension. But there's a lot of women that I've interviewed where their success almost makes their relationship stronger because they feel like they can really be themselves in mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I would say for Brandon and I, that was a learning curve for sure, because, you know, we both grew up in church and um, both of our parents had those classic roles. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, my husband's dad was a pastor. His wife was a pastor's wife. And so luckily, you know, my mother-in-law, she is very much, we're very much the same people. She's like, I'm going to speak whether you let me or not, you know, and my father-in-law's great. He lets her, you know, and not lets her, but you know what I mean. Right. He he it gives works. her a platform. It works for yes. Them. Yeah. And my mom kind of runs the roost in our house too. My dad, when he puts his foot down, it, my mom is quiet, but she's like, you know, the neck that turns the head. She's <laughs> very much that way. For my husband and I, I would say that it's it was a little bit of a struggle because when I was really crushing it, I I think I got a big head. Mm-hmm. I think there for me, there was a season where I was like, I don't need to do these things at home because look what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that really hurt our relationship Um, because I feel like I lost some of my feminine side. I feel like I lost, I feel like I tried to be the man, like I'm the provider, look what I'm doing, you know, and the world depends on me. And, and I needed to eat a big fat piece of humble pie. And that was hard. Mm -hmm. And that was hard, but it's, it's, now the pendulum has swung the other way. And so I think with business, it it's it's can be not only strugglesome in relationship with the outside world and people, it couldn't create tension in the home if you don't figure out how to balance everything. And, and I, also learn lessons. It sounds like you learned some lessons. That heck, would, yeah. Yeah. heck yeah. 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 You know, I I feel like in the what I was doing was teaching and, you know, people would say, I want my picture taken with you. And, you know, even though I knew deep down, like they don't really want their picture taken with me because of me, they want it so that they can say Mm -hmm. they took a class and then Mm -hmm. put it on their Instagram so they can get more clients. And I get that. But I think there was a level of it going to my head, like the world hairstylists need me. Mm -hmm. And so you all can take a back seat because they, I'm needed. And so it did do something for me and my own self-esteem and my own worth. Like I said, t- attaching your business to your worth. And um, yeah, I ended up having to take a break, a big break. Um, from after I taught in New York, it was like at home, it was it was just my husband and I's relationship was all work, all work and kids. There was no like, we didn't talk about anything else but work. And then... I was going to quit it all. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I just want to be a mom. I'm getting rid of the salon. I'm getting rid of the method. I'll sell the method. Take it all. I don't even care. Because if I'm going to lose my family Mm -hmm. over or relationship with my kids or relationship with my husband um, over this, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Mm -hmm. It it wasn't worth it. And so I took a break 
And then I had what I would consider almost a nervous breakdown um, to the point where I didn't speak for a week, didn't talk at all. I, the minute I would go to talk, uh, my, my thoughts were like every which way. And I just had to stop talking because I was getting anxiety so bad. And I ended up, the only outlet I had was I had a notebook and anytime I wanted to say something, I just would write it down instead and just get it off my brain on paper. And I did that for a week solid. And then my husband, without telling me, signed me up for a leadership training course in San Diego, booked me a flight and said, you're going. And my husband is very frugal and the course was $3,500. So for him to do that without even talking to me, there was, it was desperate times. Ended up going to the course, kept journaling, kept journaling, kept journaling. I kept praying through text message or through writing, writing down my thoughts, writing down my prayers. And as I'm just writing it and filled up an entire notebook in one month of just random thoughts. Some of them I read now and I'm like, oh, I looked crazy. <laughs> but as I'm reading it, I just kept seeing over and over underline less is more, less is more, less is more. Say no so you can maximize your yes. Say no so you can maximize your yes. And through that, my online course was born. Just, I mean, it was literally on paper written out like a textbook. Mm. And that's that to me was like totally, I'm a firm believer that was God's way of saying like, you no longer have to travel everywhere. You can do what you're doing. You can reach everyone from your own home mm -hmm. and still you can have that perfect balance. And when you submit, for me, when you submit to his will, it was like, I didn't know how this was going to make sense. I was going to quit it all. And now I can have it all. Mm -hmm. So that was long winded, but I didn't know that about your story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. So what am I not asking you? Anything that I didn't ask that you think our listeners should hear? Um, I would say it's what we talked about in the other room is like, um, don't be afraid to fail. And I was going to bring up that eyelash business. I, I, <laughs> it's laughable now. And I have almost looks like a, a goodwill in my garage <laughs> <laughs> from the ideas that I had. I was going to start a baby boutique when I had my daughter. Her name was Sophie. Her name is Sophie. And when I was pregnant with my son, I was for sure that I was going to have another girl. I mean, this is me like thinking I'm going to manifest things, right? I already had a girl. I'm going to have another girl. I'm going to name her Olivia. I'm creating an online boutique called Sofa and Olive. <laughs> I built the website. I'm not even kidding you. Bought all the stuff. Painted the vision in my husband's mind. I was like, it's going to be amazing. Oh, check out all this stuff. And he's like, okay. <laughs> Thank God for him. He lets me run with these ideas. And now I have bins of baby bottles, um, bibs of <laughs> the cutest things for, for a baby boutique. And I'm like, well, I have baby shower gifts forever. <laughs> and then I was going to start an eyelash business. And I'm like, okay, it's done. I'm naming it. I branded it. I, I had custom little cases made. And then I was like, no, that's not for me. So now I have a thousand dollars worth of eyelashes. <laughs> And told all my friends, and they laugh at me. But, you know, eventually something sticks. Mm -hmm. You know, it sticks. And I would say don't be afraid to fail over and over again. Yeah, Because failure is just like one way not to do something. And I think the world looks at failure like, um, you know, you're done for. Mm -hmm. And to me, like, it's those, those setbacks. I'm totally quoting Georgia Shore here, you guys from what's his name that says it. He goes, it's like your setbacks or your setups, mm -hmm. you know? It's like it, you appreciate the wins so much more when you've had the losses. If you only have wins, it's like kids who are spoon-fed. They never appreciate hard work. Mm -hmm. And it's it's those people that have had to work for it who've had the failures. So it's, I would say it's exactly what we were talking about. Is like people think when you, you know, have a level of success that you just, it comes natural for you. No, it's just series of being uncomfortable and learning to be comfortable in the uncomfortable is what I would say. Cause it's still not comfortable. Like 
podcasting. This is new for me. I was so nervous. I actually like prayed in the car and I was like, oh my God, because my biggest fear in life, and I'm just sharing it with you guys, is like, I don't want to sound dumb. Like that's my biggest, that's the ultimate. If I could get to the core of who I am, I hate sounding like I'm not taken serious because I'm so lighthearted or sounding dumb. So to put me in a room with microphones where it's everything that's coming out of my mouth, it was crazy nerve wracking. So when I was asked and I said, yes. That's a great job. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you said yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been uncomfortably amazing. Thank you. My last question. Yeah. Do you have a book or a podcast you would recommend to our listeners? Hmm. That's been impactful to you or maybe one that you recommend to people? I would say I love Amy Porterfield Mm -hmm. and Jenna Kutcher. They are, they're amazing. They're real. Amy Porterfield to me is like, she's so real and they give so much free resources Mm -hmm. to start. You know, that's what I would say. Awesome. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have to do this again. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. To learn more about Moms Making Six Figures, head over to momsmakingsixfigures.com. That's right, momsmakingsixfigures.com.